G'day, Troy Dean from WP Elevation, and welcome to episode number 53 of the WP Elevation podcast. That's right, episode number 53. Uh, Today, (laughs) I'm just in a bit of a wacky mood. Today, we are going to meet J.D. Peterson, who is Senior Vice President of Marketing at Scripted.com. Now, if you don't know what Scripted is, they are a curated marketplace that connect great writers of content with businesses that need content. I have visited their offices in San Francisco when I was there last year, I think it was last year, um, and hung out with Eric and Matt at Scripted. Uh, JD has come across from Zendesk, he's joined them recently, and in this episode, you know, if you ever think that you're just kind of making it up as you go along, and you don't really know what you're doing, that's okay, because big companies like Scripted that have raised millions of dollars in funding also feel the same. And JD lets that cat out of the proverbial bag in this episode. And he's also uh, giving away a 50% coupon for your first order at scripted.com. So if you're thinking about using them to get content written for your clients, this could be a great opportunity to win that competition and take them for a spin. It's a very exciting episode. JD's a lovely man. We talk about his six-year-old and um, uh, what he does in his time off and how he keeps his head together. We also talk about the three stages of a startup business and blood, sweat, and tears. And I'm not talking about the 70s alt jazz band either. Uh, stay with us. Let's elevate. This is the WP Elevation Podcast. Helping WordPress consultants elevate. This episode of the WP Elevation podcast is, of course, proudly brought to you by Video User Manuals, the first, the original, the best, the only way to teach your clients how to use WordPress. If you're building websites for clients using WordPress and you don't want to teach them how to use WordPress once you hand the site over, just install the Video User Manuals plugin and we'll do it for you. It puts over 60 video tutorials in the client's WordPress dashboard, teaching your clients how to use WordPress, how to use uh, WPSEO by Yoast, and how to use WooCommerce if they're, if those plugins are installed. And of course, you can turn individual videos off. You can add your own videos for custom post types like testimonials or staff profiles that you might have added. You can, uh, what else can you do? You can put your own logo on the whole thing. You can rebrand it, make it look like your own. You can serve it up in Australian American or in or native British accents. Um, what else can you do? Um, oh, you can save it, uh, set it up the way you like it with your branding and your videos and, and the way that you like it set up. And then you can save that as a master profile. And the next time you install it, you just tick a button, use master profile, and it's all set up, pre-configured for you. Pretty snazzy, hey? And you can get it for $1 for your first month. That's right, one buck for your first month. Take it for a spin, put it on some client sites, see it in action, uh, let it unleash its power. And uh, then, of course, it is $24 a month after that, I think. That price is about to go up, so I'd be quick if I was you. Lock it in. Um, Anyway, you can check out more at videousermanuals.com or wpelevation.com slash vum. Have a look at the video of the plugin in action and um, watch a little video of me presenting it to my wife, pretending that she's a client, and you'll see how you can use this plugin to win more jobs. There you go. My elevation tip this week is don't do everything yourself. It's pretty simple. If you want to burn out, do everything yourself. If you want to build a successful business and survive and have a life, don't do everything yourself. Um, I'm using Scripted to write some content for clients. I'm using Scripted to write some blog posts for myself. Uh, That's right. I actually don't write all of the words that I publish. I know it's shocking to some people. They might not believe that. They might find it hard to believe. But I just don't have time to write all the words that I want to get out onto the internet, and I'm a terrible, terrible typist. Um, And it hurts my fingers to type because I type with these two fingers like this. I'm sorry to be rude, but my two middle fingers, I type like that, I don't know why, but it hurts. I get pains in my, these fingers from typing. I don't wanna type, I dictate a lot, I talk a lot. I'm clearly very good at talking. I talk a lot, and I'm also very humble, obviously. I talk a lot, and um, I dictate, make notes, bullet points, send that off to a writer, and then, she, she writes it, has it written, and it looks perfect, and it's still my thoughts and my opinions and my words. I just don't actually do the physical typing thing. So anyway, don't do everything yourself. Uh, surround yourself with people who are really good at what they do so you can elevate up the food chain in the business. 
Um, and we're going to learn a lot about that from J.D. Peterson, who is our guest this week. He is Senior Vice President at Scripted.com, and of course, they connect great copywriters and content writers with businesses that need content for content marketing. JD is also giving away a prize this week. Of course, we have a prize every week on the podcast. In fact, episode number 48, we gave away a license of PDIG, which is a WordPress bootstrap theme framework from Alex uh, Moss at Firecast, valued at $189, and D from the UK won it. You can check that out on our website. We do give away all of our prizes. The reason is we dangle a little carrot so that you watch the podcast or listen to the podcast and learn some stuff. Um, and we you know, also dangle a little carrot to get you to leave comments and engage with us uh, because that's what we're about here, about building the community and giving free stuff away in the process. So uh, JD this week has sponsored 50% off your first scripted order. If you want to win that prize, you'll have to watch the interview or listen to the interview and learn how to enter that competition a little bit later on. But without further ado, let's go and meet JD Peterson and find out what the JD stands for. G'day, Troy Dean from WP Elevation, and I'm very pleased to have with me all the way from San Francisco, the offices of scripted.com, JD Peterson. Hey man, how are you? I'm doing great. Glad to be here with you. Thanks for hanging out with us on the podcast. Um, I've got to ask, what does the JD stand for? The JD actually stands for Jack Daniels. My dad liked to hit the sauce a little bit. No, no. <laughs> I'm kidding about that. Uh, actually, it, it stands for John David. I, uh, I had parents from the southern part of the United States, and they like to use two names down there. So it was, it was never John. It was always John David. John David, but, right. I think once I rolled into school age, we decided to shorten that to JD a little easier. <laughs> and, and so when did the Jack Daniels story come about? Is that something you kind of rehearsed over time or was it just something it, that came off the cuff one day? It, I think it came off the cuff the first time, but boy, I, yeah, I've been relying on that for 20 years now. <laughs> awesome. Well, for those that don't know, scripted.com, of course, is where you go to get your content written by great writers and stick around for details on how to enter the competition because... JD has very kindly offered a prize this week where you get 50% off your first order at scripted.com. So stick around for details on how you can enter that competition a little bit later on. Okay, before we start talking about all things web and entrepreneur and startup and Silicon Valley and all that exciting stuff, when you were a kid, what did you want to be when you grew up? Ah, oh, when I was a kid. I think probably like a lot of kids, uh, I, I thought I was going to be a professional athlete You know, at some point. I thought, thought I was going to go down that route. But I think Fairly early on, I realized that that was going to be a problem because I had no athletic ability whatsoever. <laughs> um, so then really, really, the, the next thing I kind of focused on for a lot of years is I thought I was going to be a sports broadcaster. Oh. So I thought I was going to still be involved in that realm, but, but broadcasting the games. And I don't know, that probably fizzled out maybe just before college. But, but right. that, that was, when you asked me if, when I was a kid, that's definitely what I was thinking about. The lack of athletic talent's just a minor speed hump, isn't it? You know? <laughs> yeah, yeah. A little tough to get over in that field, but uh, yeah, we tried, we tried. <laughs> when, at what point did you discover the internet and think, okay, this is something where I think I'm going to be spending a lot of my time and I might have a career here? Yeah, that was definitely in my college years, and I won't date myself too much, but let's just say my college years were about when the internet was kind of getting going. Uh -huh. um, so, you know, I, I had come across maybe, I don't know, CompuServe and some of the very early kind of things going on in the internet, but just very tangentially. Um, for me, when it really came into play and I s sort of first became a user and got enamored with the internet, was in my college years. And it's funny, the, the thing I was doing on the internet, I was a big fan of the band The Grateful Dead. I'm kind of uh, a deadhead uh, at heart. And I was using the internet to look up and see what did they play? What were the set lists of their shows? And then I realized, wow, there's these sites that are springing up where you could trade tapes and music with other fans. And you know, really, it was kind of a love of music that got me into the internet, and um, I think actually, you know, that that sort of use case was one that was pretty dominant back then. It was a lot of like fans of things like that, who I think really were some of the early communities on the web, at least. Yeah, um, and and you know, it's funny because I'm kind of noticing now that the, like the internet got like brought the world closer together, and everyone has kind of leveled the playing field, but. It seems to me like now that all these little kind of tribal chunks are splitting off again and it's going back to these kind of micro communities rather than this one big global community. Yeah, no, I, I think there's definitely some truth in that. Every, every, everybody's kind of niche. There's just so many little niches and little branches of things that have, that have sprung up that I think um, 
you know, it's a place where you can really find things that, that interest you very specifically and find a small community of people who think like you or are into the same things as you. So, yeah, I totally agree. I see that happening a lot. Do you remember the first time? I mean, I know you're not actually a WordPress developer, but I'm curious. Do you remember the first time you, you saw the WordPress dashboard at all? Yeah, quite a while ago, actually. I mean, I, I don't. I'm going to guess in the ballpark of you know eight ten years ago, maybe maybe more. Uh, but but uh, you know quite a while ago when I first came across it, and it was really looking at blogging specifically is when I first kind of learned about what WordPress kind of played it around with a little bit, knew a couple people who were using that for blog. Uh, fortunately or unfortunately, my blogging career wasn't too prolific, so I didn't re- didn't really stay with the platform uh, too long. But then went on to work at a few businesses who used WordPress to either power our blog. Or in the case of a couple companies, including the my current as well as my last, it powered our whole website really. Ah. And we were WordPress shops. Ah, so scripted.com is is powered by WordPress, yeah? It is in fact, yes, yeah. Wow, there you go. I didn't know that. That's uh, it is too. I'm looking at the source code right now. There you go. It's all WordPress. Fantastic. There's a little trick for you kids if you didn't know that. Look at the source code, it'll tell you if it's on WordPress. Um, Okay, thinking about what you do, uh, and we'll talk a little bit about your trajectory before uh, Scripted, but thinking about what you do at Scripted now, when you meet someone for the first time and they ask you what you do or what Scripted is, what, what's the elevator pitch, so to speak? Yeah, when I'm stuck in an elevator uh, with somebody, the, the, the way I describe Scripted, pretty simple. We provide businesses with an easy way to get high-quality original content. Um, we do that through a marketplace. We're a marketplace business. And what we provide is a marketplace of freelance writers um, that we vet and we use technology to qualify, vet, and match the best possible writer with the particular project that a business had. So what we ultimately take care of for businesses is delivering them the high quality content they want in the end, but we handle all the logistics, kind of everything involved in getting that content from idea to the final product. So the obvious question is, you know, someone might say, well, you know, how you, and this is the obvious question for me before I started using Scripted, and I know the answer, I think I know the answer now, but the obvious question for someone who's never used something like Scripted or a complete stranger is, well, how are you any different to Odesk or Elance or Fiverr or any other place I can go and get freelance writers? Yeah, sure, um, definitely. It, it's, a, it's a, you know, an easy, you know, uh, or a question that's quite common and I think comes up with a lot of people. Um, first and foremost, we... With, the, with a lot of those systems, with the majority of those systems, what they really are is just allowing you access to a pool of writers, but you're still essentially having to vet those writers. You're having to choose which of those writers you think is appropriate for your job. You're essentially doing a short form of, of looking through resumes, right? Mm-hmm. You're looking at a set of profiles. You're having to still select that writer, um, and then you're having to agree on a rate and kind of work through the payment and that sort of thing, um, as well as handle really, again, all the logistics uh, throughout the process, um, and you know, quite frankly, uh, those those pools of freelancers, those communities that some of those systems use, are kind of spread around the world. Um, there's not a lot of vetting that goes into the process of who gets to be in that community of writers. With scripted, it's very different. We're really focused on kind of a little bit of a higher end and a really truly quality product. We vet all the writers. They have to take a very difficult and extensive English test. Uh, you know, we, we, we eliminate 20% of candidates right there just at an English test level. Then they've got to provide writing samples, which we vet through our own community. Um, and that's just a couple of the, give you just a little taste of kind of the vetting process that goes through with us. Um, and then we're ultimately doing the matching and selecting the best writer for a client. So there's no trolling through profiles and resumes and all that sort of thing. You're describing and giving guidelines for your job. We're going to use technology and people to figure out the best possible writer for that job, match you up, and make it happen. Let's. I mean, we're kind of jumping ahead here, but I want to talk about this now because it's it's timely. That the the misconception, and I was guilty of this when I first started using Scripted and similar services for you know other creative um, things. The mis yeah. the, the misconception is that I can write a brief, and uh, you know, and and the first thing that I'm going to get back is going to be absolutely mind-blowingly perfect, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's just not reality, is it? It's just not. I mean, I mean, ultimately, we're still talking about a, a thing that has a, a big level of subjectivity to it, right? It's, it's <laughs> right. It's not, it's not a black or white type thing. Yeah, it's um, not math. <laughs> It's not, it's not, it's not math. It's, it's not two plus two equals four. Is that right? That's right, it is, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm a marketing guy. Uh, 
But, uh, but no, I, I, think, I think that's absolutely right. And, and what Scripted allows you to do, though, is to have a revision process. So we'll deliver a first draft on a set time schedule to the client. But, yeah, generally then there is a little bit of back and forth and editing. What's great about Scripted is that's all done right in the platform. You don't have to go exchange emails, try to set up phone call times, anything like that. It's all done right in the platform. Um, but, yeah, certainly that's the dream. And occasionally it happens where the first draft will be – you know, acceptable and perfect, but usually it does go through a revision process. I think I, I uh, we hit a home run recently with Scripted. We um, I found a writer who, because I, I tend to be a little bit opinionated in the way that I blog and the way that I write, and <clears throat> and frankly, I mean, I let the cat out of the bag here. I don't actually write 100% of the words that I publish. Sorry if that's <laughs> shocking to anyone. Um, uh, but I, I, I hit a home run recently where I found a writer on Scripted who, because everyone I'd kind of used was just, just kind of playing it a little bit safe, which I totally understand that they're trying to keep the client happy. And, and I found this, I don't know whether it was a guy or a girl, but I found this writer who was just as opinionated as me, but nice. knows how to walk that line perfectly. And I was like, right, perfect. Now I've found a great writer. And it's, it's like, it's, you know, I had to manage my own expectations the first few times I was using scripted. I was like, okay, what is it, what is it about my brief that they're not understanding or are they just playing it safe? And I think I got better at telling them, hey, loosen up, show me some personality. This isn't yeah. technical writing. This is an opinion piece. And as my briefs got better, the results that I was getting back from writers was improving. No, I think, I think you've hit on a couple things there that, 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 are, that are really interesting and key to our business. One, by the way, I hope you hit the favorite button. My, one of my favorite features we have in Scripted is the ability to actually favorite a writer. Yep. So when you find someone who's done a great job or has that fit with you, you can actually, you know, just like you do in social media or whatever, you can favorite that writer and then and we'll do our best to continue to match you up with that writer going forward. Um, but yeah, I, I think that, you know, one, the, really one of the main keys to success with using a system like ours is the upfront work that you're going to do to define what it is you're looking for, to describe to people as best you can what success is going to be and what the guidelines, what the specifications are. And, that's one of the things that when we do have our services team get involved with particular clients, that's really one of the things we help and assist and guide people. And ultimately for our self-service business, which is the bulk of how clients use us, we want to continue to find ways in our product itself to kind of tease those things out of you. Because, because really asking the right questions, getting the right information from you up front is going to help match you with the best person and then ultimately deliver the best content that's going to fit your needs. In your case, maybe very opinionated. Yeah. So if there's so if there's just a little just to kind of wrap this up because on this particular topic, I mean this is true when you're briefing developers or designers or photographers or writers or anyone involved in the process. What is there like one thing, one takeaway that you could suggest that freelancers and consultants use when they're briefing other creative people to make sure that that what they get back is what they're expecting? Like, is there one thing that we can say in our communication that will help get that person on the same page? Yeah, I mean, I don't know if there's some sort of a magic bullet or anything, but I think, and maybe this will be a funny, funny answer, is you've, you've got to be detailed and thorough, but also keep it simple. And that, that, that maybe sounds like opposing things, but I think on the simplicity side, like, you've got to, as best you can, stay away from jargon and, and you know, kind of very specific industry terms of that. Use simple, plain language that anybody can understand, but then be, be thorough. You know, I think yeah. the, time, yeah. the time you invest up front will definitely save, you know, downstream headaches. I think, I think with any project, maybe that, that's really the case, is the more time you can invest up front in getting, you know, as detailed as possible. If you don't do that up front, you're just going to have back and forth, and it's going to happen downstream anyway. So. It's kind of like teaching a six-year-old how to wash a car, right? <laughs> I haven't tried that with my six. I have a six year old. And I haven't tried that yet. But, uh. I don't have a six year old either. But I imagine, <laughs> I imagine it would just be like teaching a six year old to wash a car. Keep it really simple, but thorough and detailed. <laughs> yes, you got to clean it well. Yes, definitely. Awesome. Um, so you are senior vice president of marketing. Is that right? It's scripted, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. What does a senior vice president of marketing actually spend their time doing day to day? Podcasts like this. Uh, <laughs> uh, no, it's a great question. Um, right now, and, and context for the audience, um, I joined Scripted in this particular role just a month ago, so yeah. I'm still fairly new here um, in this particular role. So right now, today, a lot of what I'm doing is frankly trying to understand our business. It's a lot of looking at data, 
Um, and I think marketing in general nowadays, and especially at the executive level in marketing, it's become a very technical profession. Mm. And it's a very data analytical uh, driven profession. And that's what I'm doing a lot right now is really looking at data, trying to figure out what, you know, look at what we do have and try to understand the business and what metrics and, uh, and what levers we can adjust, but really trying to determine long term, what are the right metrics for us to look at and focus on to be able to properly drive this business and make decisions going forward. So I'm doing that. I'm thinking about, you know, how are we going to spend money going forward, how we're going to bring in leads, all that kind of stuff. I think once, you know, once at scale, kind of what does a VP of marketing do? You know, to me, it's a very people heavy position. And I spend really a lot of my time meeting with people. And those are from different constituency. There's my employees, where I think my main responsibilities are ensuring that we're aligned on priorities and then helping remove any roadblocks that they might have, right? Whether that's money or resources or you know, uh, bouncing ideas, whatever it might be, I feel my job's here to remove roadblocks for them. So there's my employees. Then there's future employees. I'm a huge believer in talent and people is what drives great businesses. So I've got to spend a lot of my time, you know, thinking about my next hires, recruiting and, and you know, interviewing and working on current hires, but also kind of doing that soft level recruiting for things I might need down the road in the future. Um, so, you know, employees, potential employees, partners, customers, um, I try in my particular role to reach out and talk to customers as often as humanly possible. Um, really, the only way I can best market and go find customers is to, to talk to and understand how do our customers think, where do they hang out, what do they like, what do they dislike about the product. So I think a lot of my day-to-day -day job is talking to people is probably the easiest way to put it. There's no – I mean, there are a lot of books about, you know – running a startup and being in this space and, and, and growing and scaling, but there's no real kind of hard and fast roadmap. Do you ever kind of feel like, do you ever kind of feel like the whole team's just kind of making it up as you go along? Absolutely. <laughs> and, I don't, and I don't think yes. it's anything to be ashamed of. Yeah, I don't think it's anything to be ashamed of. I think that most of the very successful companies that I've either worked at or, or been around in some capacity, I don't think they followed a set playbook or a distinct playbook. I think that a lot of them, you know, really made things up as they go along and, um, you know, blood, sweat and tears. You know, that, that's my magic answer for how to, how to, you know, how, how to build a startup is, um, you know, you've got to have that vision, you've got to stay true to it. And then it's really just about the work you put in. Because it's very easy to reverse engineer success, isn't it? You know, you hear all these stories on the internet all the time about someone who's hit a home run. And like, I just read Biz Stone's book uh, about, you know, the success of Twitter. And it's like, it's yeah. very easy to reverse engineer success. But I'm not sure I've ever seen anyone say, well, well, here's, how I, here, you know, here's me reverse engineering the success I had with that startup, and now here, here's how I'm going to do exactly the same thing again and get exactly the same success. Totally. Yeah, I, I completely agree. I just I don't think there's a – unfortunately, it'd be a lot easier if that was the case, right? Then we just run the blueprint and do it again. Yeah. And certainly, I mean, there's things you borrow. There's things you learn from your experiences. There's inspiration and things you borrow from other people. But yeah, there's going to be a good portion of what you do that's going to be making it up as you go. I think that's very um, inspiring for our audience. Who are who, most of our audience are, you know, very small teams or freelancers or solopreneurs, and they quite often feel like you know they're making it up as they go along. And they quite often look at larger organisations and think, well, you know, they must just have the secret playbook that we don't have. And I think what larger organizations have are, are resources and people, which means you can actually get things done. But I, the more I kind of dig into this and the more I talk to people on podcasts, the more I realize that everyone's just kind of making it up as they go along, which is very refreshing for us little guys, you know? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, what's the one thing that keeps you awake at night apart from your six-year-old? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, good. That, that was the right answer. Um, boy, I would say quality. Right. I mean, that would be my one word answer. And I, and I think it manifests itself in a lot of different ways. But that's what keeps me up at night. I mean, in, in, especially in our business specifically, as you know, we described it earlier, we fall apart if we can't just deliver good quality to people um, at the end, the, the end result product, but also the whole experience the whole way through. I'm, I'm a big believer. Maybe if there is a blueprint or a playbook that, that, that I do believe in or works is focus on the customer experience, you know, build a remarkable experience all the way through from the first time. You interact with a potential customer all the way through their life cycle. And I think that's what keeps me up at night. Are we doing the right things to provide the best quality experience to our users? And, um, you know, when I wake up at four in the morning thinking about work, uh, it's usually something related in that bucket. <laughs> yeah. Um, 
Uh, so, so uh, kind of a, a, a wedge of that question is: if there was, one, if you had a magic wand and could fix one thing right now in the business, what would it be? Air conditioning. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. If you, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know how well this Skype camera is doing here, but it, I am sweating profusely, and right. I'm not nervous. Let me let me tell you all that. Let me promise you, I'm not nervous. We are a small startup, a scrappy startup, and usually in San Francisco, you can get by without air conditioning, right. and so normally it's not a big deal, but man, it's been hot in here lately, and so uh, at the moment, my answer is I just want air conditioning, <laughs> and I want to wave the magic wand and have cool air blowing through here. Um, besides that, I mean, I don't, I don't know if there's you know sort of one particular thing that I see is broken that you know I wish the magic wand could fix, but you know, most of my mindset right now is just on scale. Um, I, I, I always look at startups as there's kind of a few different stages. There's kind of the first stage where you're just trying to prove, you know, do we have a product? Is, is there a market here? Is, is there something we can, you know, kind of do here? Once you get past that stage, then you're moving into, is this actually a business, right? You can have a good idea. You can have a good product, but you've got to establish, can we start selling this? Can we extract value, you know, from a marketplace? Can we actually turn this into a business? After that, you start going into scale mode is, you know, can we turn this into something that, you know, we can sell to lots of people and we can, you know, start to turn into many millions of dollars and things of that nature. And um, that's probably kind of where we are as a business. And so, again, I don't know if it's one particular thing, but if I had the magic wand, it'd be, you know, just helping us with scale issues, helping us understand, you know, what are the right hires we need to make? What does the org chart look like two year, a year from now, two years from now? Um, and, and be able to kind of, you know, have a smooth runway, if you will, to get to that, that next level of scale. How do you know when you've got a business and it's time to start scaling? I think that too, kind of like our blueprint discussion, I think that too varies by business, the type of business you have, the type of industry uh, that you were in. Um, I think it's, it's, it's going to be some magic number of revenue or customers or you know, that sort of a thing. And again, I think it, I think it varies uh, you know, across the different kinds of business you have. And certainly if you're a one-person consultant, it's going to be a lot different answer than if you're trying to build a, a so enterprise software business hmm. um, and that sort of thing. So I think it varies across companies. Um, but it's also one of those things where I think you kind of know it when you get there. Yeah. Um, and is it something that the founders just kind of can feel? that, like, you know, Because it takes a lot of energy, doesn't it, for the entire team to try and scale something. So is it... I don't imagine you go into I don't imagine you go into scale the scale process accidentally or lightheartedly. Like it's a deliberate decision that you make as a team that we're going to try and ramp this thing up. Yeah, I, I think I think it's absolutely a deliberate decision where you've gotten to a point, and you know, for startups like ours, a lot of that might might tie to funding rounds. If you if you're the kind of business that's backed by venture capitalists and that sort of thing, it might be directly tied to hey, we're going to go get funding for the specific purpose of scaling the business now to take it to that next level. Um, so, you know, that, that's one example. But I think, I think, yeah, I think you're absolutely right that it's a very conscious decision um, that I think companies make that, hey, we're going to take this thing and we're going to speed up the growth. We're going to see if we can go scale it. Just on the air conditioning thing, I was in your office about 18 months ago when I was uh, – actually, it was probably about two years ago now, I think, uh, maybe or maybe a year ago. Anyway, uh, I was in San Francisco for a week in between WordCamp Europe and Pressnomics down in Arizona, and I met Eric – and Matt in the office there, and yeah. I must say, it was this perception thing where, you know, for me, scripted was this kind of big, you know, Bay Area based startup, and I, I, you know, had to go hunting around the street to find the little doorway that goes up the stairs to the office, and there was this little sign above the door, and I was like, really, is this it? And I walked in, I'm like, wow, <laughs> this is, this is like, like as you said, this is the office of a scrappy startup that, and it was, it was, um, it was very refreshing for me to see. So many people kind of in this, it's a beautiful space and you've got beautiful, you know, greenery and beautiful natural light coming in. It had a really great feeling, but it had yeah. a also had a really good team kind of feeling in there that everyone in there was on the same page, playing the same game, working towards the same goals. There was a really good energy about the place and there was no it's air conditioning. <laughs> it's, one, it's one of the, not the air conditioning part, but, but the other it is really one of the main reasons that drew me to the company was the feel that we had and kind of the culture we had. And I think... We had a lot of tenants of kind of the classic sort of Silicon Valley, South of market startup um, kind of environment. But because of the nature of our business, it's also blended with this sort of, uh, with writers. I mean, with sort of this liberal arts mindset 
you know, along with the engineering and the technology that I'm very used to in various SaaS businesses and software companies, it was a weird and but cool kind of blend of that along with kind of a true creative professional type place, a place where writers work. You know, mm. half of our staff here are themselves right trained, you know, writers or editors by background. Or, I mean, frankly, even some of our engineers are people that, you know, they're engineers by trade, but really writing and literature is kind of their passion in life, mm. and they're kind of that, that weird mix. So I think we've done a good job of recruiting people who really care about content and the written word, and I think that manifests in, like I said, this sort of interesting dynamic here we have in our culture that we're kind of a, a slightly different than maybe the normal startup around this neighborhood. <laughs> mm. What do you do when you're not working? How do you keep your head from exploding? <laughs> Yeah, good question. Uh, I'm still trying to figure that out. Um, well, we, we mentioned the six-year-old. So I, I have two, two young girls, two beautiful young girls who take up the bulk of my time when I'm not working. Um, we also mentioned Jack Daniels earlier. I think uh -huh. Drew, I'm outside the office. But yeah, I know kids and family is, is, the, is the bulk of my time when I'm not thinking about scripted. Um, beyond that, try to get outdoors when I can. One of the great things about living in California, we've got great weather, we've got great scenery. So getting outdoors whenever I can. Mm. Uh, now, let's talk about the origins of Scripted for a moment. Um, scripted, sure, yeah. scripted started out as Script, S-C-R-I-P-P-E-D, and was a, was a startup designed to help playwrights and, and movie writers sell scripts to studios, right? Yeah, yeah absolutely. So the business was started, um, one of the programs was in grad school down in Los Angeles, and had a really good friend who was kind of the classic struggling screenwriter trying to bust into the movie business. And our founder, and who's now our CEO, Sunil, um, looked at his friend and basically said, hey, it's just not fair that somebody who's so talented like this can't get his work you know, seen by studios, picked up by producers, that sort of thing. So he had this vision at the time of, you know, what if we could create kind of essentially Google Docs for script writers where People working on scripts could collaborate with each other, and then ultimately they could publish these scripts to a system where then we'd get you know, Hollywood producers to come and buy these scripts from this community at large. And what was interesting is they essentially got half of it right. By building this tool initially, they got some crazy number. I think it might have been as high as 80,000 mm. screenwriters, you know, part-time writers or whatever, joined the community to start using and, and writing scripts. The problem was they didn't get the other half right. They, they didn't have the Hollywood connections, and ultimately, they just really weren't solving a, a, an acute enough problem for producers. So ultimately, nobody bought the scripts, right? Great tool, get a community of writers writing, but there was no one on the other end to buy the scripts. But then in 2011, a really interesting thing happened. Levi's, the maker of Blue Jeans, Levi's reached out to Scripted and said, hey, we heard you got this great community of writers. We clearly don't need a movie script, but hey, we've got a bunch of advertising we need to do about our jeans and product descriptions. Do you have any writers that could help us with that? And long story short, the light went off and they kind of moved business uh, into the area of, hey, let's create content for businesses and let's, let's leverage a community of there's a marketplace of writers, you know, not for Hollywood screenplays, but for businesses creating web content. It's a really interesting timeline on the scripted website, <clears throat> scripted.com uh, slash who we are. And um, so, if, you know, the start of 2008, 1st of January, script is born. Uh, by the end of, uh, by the end of t so three years later, by the start of 2011, 80,000 writers, but, uh, you know, can't sell screenplays to, to movie producers. And that's when the pivot happens and they start connecting the writers with businesses. So three years there, they're building a community of writers and then... Uh, by the end of November, so within 11 months, the business gains enough traction to get uh, a seed round funding of a million dollars within 11 months of that pivot happening. So what was going on? I mean, you, you might not know because you weren't there, but what the hell was going on in those first three years? How were the founders? Like, the founders just... I mean, that's almost like a zombie company, isn't it? Three years with these, you know, all these writers and no one buying it. Like, how did they not just collapse the whole thing? Because 80,000 writers is, is too big to shut down, isn't it? Absolutely. And, you know, I mentioned blood, sweat and tears earlier, and I think they would definitely share that they've had all those in, in droves. Um, scrappiness really to keep the business going. And I should say in some of those early years, they were still working other full time jobs and mm -hmm. kind of doing this as a, as a side thing, nights, weekends, and really kind of burning the midnight oil to keep it alive. But but yeah, I mean, you said it, they had the supply side, 
you know, very organically and from early on really grew in the writer side of the business. And then, you know, getting to that million dollar seed was really just starting to prove, hey, we can turn that we can now we can sell this to businesses and we can leverage this supply side uh, and really provide a valuable service for businesses. Awesome. What are you most excited about at Scripted right now? What's the what's the kind of the trend that you see happening or what's what's happening over the next three months that's really got your blood pumping? Yeah, I think we're, you know, we're really we're ramping up the marketing, I mean, which was a lot of the reason I came. And so it's exciting. We're going to be spending a little more, getting a little creative, doing some experiment, experimenting with new channels and new ideas. So that definitely gets me excited. Um, I mean, I'm excited about content marketing in general and not just helping and providing our service for other businesses, but for ourselves too. And so I'm excited about some of the possibilities and some of the things we're planning to do with our own content, kind of our own content marketing efforts. Um, that ga- that definitely gets me excited, and um, you know, really, I'm just excited about kind of the whole, the whole, really, the whole space and the whole concept of marketplaces is something that really, really fires me up. Whether it's you know, uh, driving services like Uber and Lyft that are, are starting to become popular, especially here in the states, mm-hmm. where you know you can order up a cab ride with your phone. Whether it's those sort of consumer things or business sense, I think just the technology now is just making it so efficient for people to find work, for freelance people to find work in new and interesting ways. And that just keeps me really excited about Scripted is we're helping people who are talented writers that may have not had a way, at least not an easy way, to get income for practicing their craft. We're helping them do that now. We're going to keep helping many more thousands of people do that. And that really keeps me fired up. Mm. Awesome. Now, um, you came from Zendesk, right? Yeah, yeah, I did. And we were talking uh, pre-show, Zendesk have an office here now in Melbourne. I was walking down <laughs> Collins Street the other day, and there's a big sign on the building, Zendesk have arrived. And um, doing lots of hiring. They're expanding down there. Yeah. So so what was your role at, at Zendesk? So I was a VP of marketing at Zendesk as well, and I kind of balanced between product marketing, content marketing, uh, social events, you name it, all aspects of marketing at various times over my uh over three years that I spent at Zendesk, and great ride, wonderful company, and uh, also a big WordPress user. And I would actually go so far as to say that the uh, little humble, humble, not non-humble brag here. Uh, I would go so far as to say, as terms of at least B two B software companies, you're going to be hard pressed to find a better and cooler website than Zendesk, all powered on WordPress. Wow, that's cool. I'm that's going to cool. stick a I'm going to stick a link in the show notes to that, so people can go and check that out. Awesome. Yes. Um, all right, we should do the Elevation round. For those that don't know, WP Elevation is a business accelerator program for WordPress consultants, and we're going to ask uh, JD uh, some quick questions here about being a freelancer and a consultant. You've got tons of experience in dealing with these these kind of people, so a uh, series of quick questions, and hopefully you can give us some quick, uh, mind-blowing, game-changing answers off the top of your head. <laughs> okay. <laughs> no pressure. Um, what's the number one thing any freelancer needs to know? Um, I would say don't be afraid to tell your clients when they're wrong. Um, yeah, which is an interesting one. But, you know, I – look, the, the, the people doing, let's say, we're, you know, we're WordPress consulting, website developers, designers, you know, as a, as, a, as a potential client, I'm looking to you not just to fulfill my sort of needs and wishes and what I tell you are my requirements, but I want somebody who's not afraid to tell me when maybe my requirements are off. You know, if, if I'm able to articulate to you my ultimate goal, I want you to come back and some of the value you provide is not just to code the stuff up, but to you learn from your own best practices, your own experience and share those with me and tell me what you think works or why I'm wrong about putting the button here or there, or, you know, whatever it might be. Um, so, yeah, I would, I would encourage people to, you know, not be afraid to kind of, uh, you know, not just sort of follow rote orders, but, but be a part of that process of figuring out even what needs to be done. And don't be afraid to tell somebody when they're wrong. Yeah, that's great advice. And I think a lot of our listeners could uh, heed that advice and and, uh, take action on it. What's the best thing you've ever done to find new customers? The best thing I've ever done to find new customers, I would say, is treating, is providing a remarkable experience for the customers I already have. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm just a huge believer in word of mouth and organic growth and that sort of thing. And I, I lived and breathed it at Zendesk, and we're doing the same here, thing here at Scripted. The best way I can go generate leads and new business is by treating the customers I have with just, just providing them an unbelievable experience, uh, yeah. giving yeah. them that thing that they're going to want to go talk, talk about and tell other people. Um, there's nothing better than a personal reference. There just isn't. I think it's a nice segue into the next question, which is how do you stop competing on price? Because, I mean, you guys are at the top end of the market, Scripted, yeah? 
Uh, um, yeah, I mean, there, there's some people who do some professional journalism thing that can, stuff that can cost a little more than us. But yeah, we're definitely not at the low end. We're definitely, you know, a higher, higher value, a little bit higher price solution, no doubt about it. Um, you know, my answer to the question, how to not compete on price, raise your prices. <laughs> um, I, I mean, yeah, I mean, in some cases that can be, that can be the case, but you have to back that up with being able to clearly articulate your value and why you're unique and different than everybody else. Um, so I do think, hey, don't be afraid to raise your prices, charge what you think it's worth, charge what you think the value is, but you better be able to explain that to people clearly and articulate why you're more valuable than the other guy. Yeah, yeah, spot on. Um, any tips on writing better proposals apart from hiring scripted to do it? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Have us come in and, and write the proposals. Um, I don't know. I'll maybe use one of the mantras again from maybe my last job that, that we like to use in everything we did. But I would say keep it beautifully simple. Mm. And I like the term beautifully simple because it really does articulate two things. One is, is definitely keep it simple. We spoke about that earlier. The language you use, uh, you know, keeping things short and concise. We're all you know, soundbite society nowadays, nobody wants to read a massive proposal. Keep it straight to the point, simple, normal, you know, plain language. Um, but the beautiful part too, I mean, having a little bit of aesthetic, something that stands out from everybody else, maybe the way you format it, maybe the, you know, take care in the font you use, I mean, whatever it might be, but having a little aesthetic there is definitely going to help provide an emotional connection as well. But then the details, just keep them freaking simple. <laughs> yeah, beautiful. Uh, favorite tool or system for CRM? I mean, I'll have to say Zendesk, actually, not just because I work there. And maybe that's not a standard answer. I think when a lot of people think CRM, they're thinking more of the Salesforce automation tools and things like Salesforce. But to me, when you, when you break down the actual acronym, it's customer relationship management. It's not about leads and prospects, which I think where a lot of CRMs focus. So if it's really about understanding the customers you already have, I actually would say Zendesk is the best thing you can use. I'm just looking at the Zendesk website now, actually. <laughs> the little uh, kind of museum piece robot off to the side. is. Yeah, I think that's a new campaign they're running. Right that's yeah. bloody hilarious. It is a beautiful website, actually. And um, I, I've always just thought of Zendesk as support ticket software. I've never actually thought, of, thought about it uh, as anything other than that. But you make an interesting point. I might need to reinvestigate that. Um, what's the best way to keep a project and a client on track? Oh boy, um, it's probably what I talked about earlier, and I'm no project manager myself, that's for sure. Um, I think it's what I talked about earlier is investing time up front. It's the more, the more work you can do up front in the process to have a clear definition of what success looks like, clear guidelines, those sorts of things, and defining what is the, how is the communication going to take place? How, what are the checkpoints? How often are we going to check in? How are we going to do that check-in? What, what, you know, what communication vehicle? Um, so I think investing time up front, putting the diligence up front is probably the best way to keep it on track going forward. Mm. Any ideas for getting referrals from existing customers? You know, my answer to that is actually a simple one. Ask them. Um, I, I often share the story. My sister has worked a long career in nonprofit and doing a lot of fundraising for nonprofits. And it's amazing how many you know, people she'll go in to consult with and the first question she'll ask is, you know, well, you know, she'll be talking about how much money they got in the past. And the first thing she'll ask them is, well, did you ask people for money? And the answer is, well, no, we didn't. I mean, it's amazing. People are afraid to ask. And I think it's the same thing in this business. If you want a referral, obviously, first, you've got to have a high quality and create that great experience. That's where it starts. But that alone doesn't always prompt people to go tell other people. It's amazing what just asking the question. And frankly, I see lots of companies offering incentives. Hey, we'll give you a discount. I'll give you a hundred dollar Amazon card if you do a referral. I don't even think that stuff's necessary. If you're providing a good product and a good experience, I think simply by asking, would you refer somebody, uh, usually gets you good results. It's so true, you know, I find, I, I, I refer our community off to different services all the time, right? And like 99% of the time, I don't have an affiliate link for those things. I just yeah. want to be so, I mean, part of it is that I get a good little ego stroke when someone e emails me and says, oh, man, thanks for the introduction to the guys at Zirtual.com. I've got this new Zirtual Assistant, and it's friggin' amazing, and it's changed my life. And I go, oh, cool. I feel good about that. But also, part of it is that the, I know the more value I add to our community, then the more valuable I become to the community. So that's cool. worth more than me than getting a kickback. So, yeah, I, I, I kind of agree. I mean, sure, if you want to make affiliate commission or referral commission, knock yourself out. But I don't think that's the <laughs> driving... Very it's very reciprocal, yeah. no doubt about it. 
Yeah. Uh, finally, final question in the elevation round. What's the number one thing you can do to differentiate yourself? Wow. Uh, the number one thing we can do to differentiate ourselves. Let me think about that. I, I guess, and especially thinking about kind of the WordPress consultants and the type of people that are going to be the bulk of your audience, I would say the number one way you can differentiate yourself is let your work speak for itself. And I guess what I mean by that is being able to demonstrate and show the work you've done. And hopefully that alone is going to be something that, that can stand out from the rest of the pack and the competition. I mean, there's, you know, it's one thing, the language you use and all those sorts of things, but, but nothing's going to, you know, show how you're different better than actually showing the work you've done. So I, I would just keep it pretty simple and say, yeah, let, let, let the work you've done speak for itself. Yeah. It's hard to argue with quality, isn't it? <laughs> absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> awesome. Well, thank you for that. Um, just before we wrap up, what is the future of Scripted? Where do you see Scripted being in 12 months' time? What kind of services are you providing? Where's the company at? Yeah, definitely. Um, I think continuing to do what we do and continuing to perfect it, you know, as best we can, continuing to grow. I think when I look 12 months, though, I think we will definitely be branching into some uh, new areas beyond just the written work that we do today. So not branching out of content, but other things related to content, uh, whether it's through partnerships or we build it ourselves, kind of rounding out uh, other aspects of content, whether right now we're just English based, for example, so possibly offering things like translation or, mm -hmm. uh, you know, other complementary services to what we do now. So I think we'll be expanding in that direction. Uh, over time, hopefully we will start to go beyond English, break into other international markets as well. Um, but yeah, just continuing to perfect what we do. And like we said earlier, continuing to figure out how to scale this thing. Cool. Awesome. Uh, well, just before we wrap up, a quick announcement on the competition. Uh, as I said, JD is giving away 50% off your first order at scripted.com. And in order to enter the competition, tell us underneath the video here at wpelevation.com slash JD Peterson, tell us the number one thing holding you back or the number one reason you're not using scripted or something like scripted to get content written for your clients. Tell us the number one reason that you haven't done it or you're not doing it or the number one thing holding you back. And I'll get JD to swing by in a couple of weeks and award the prize. Sound good, man? Yeah, I look forward to reading those. Yeah. Yeah, awesome. Um, just before we wrap up, what is the number one piece of advice you would give any entrepreneur trying to build their own business? I mean, I said blood, and, blood sweat, and tears years earlier and I'll probably just stick with that theme. I, I think you've got to just be ready and know it's going to take a lot of hard work. There's, there's no shortcuts in trying to build one of these companies. There just isn't. Um, so, you know, figure out your vision, stay true to it, uh, stay true to your gut, you know, no doubt about that. And then just be ready to put in a lot, a lot, a lot of hard work. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. Where can people reach out and say thanks for this interview, JD? Absolutely. Yeah. You can follow me on Twitter at JD underscore Peterson. That's S-O-N. On the end, uh, you can also reach out to me directly here at Scripted. I'm just JD at Scripted.com if you want to shoot me an email. Cool. Fantastic. Um, thank you so much for spending some time with us on the podcast. I really appreciate it, man. I'm really looking forward to seeing how Scripted evolves over the next year or so and continuing to use Scripted myself. Finally, who would you like me to try and interview and why? Who would I like you to interview and why next? Um, well, since you thought it, you agreed with me that it was a beautiful looking website, you should go talk to Zendesk's webmaster, uh, Paul Godfrey, who is a, a genius when using web services. I think he would be a great addition to the podcast. Cool. Where, where's Paul based? Do you know? He's in San Francisco as well. All right. Yeah. Paul Godfrey, I'm coming to get you, courtesy of JD Peterson. So keep your eyes on your inbox. Hey, man, thanks again for spending some time with us on the podcast. Really appreciate it. And uh, all the best at Scripted. Absolutely. I'm off to go dunk my head in a barrel of ice so I can cool down here. So uh, awesome. thanks, everybody. I uh, love talking to you and uh, look forward to reading those answers for the contest. Cool. Cheers. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Bye. Alrighty, how cool is that? J.D. Peterson is a lovely man. Lots to learn from him and his journey. Uh, now he's Senior Vice President at Scripted.com, of course. Uh, this episode was brought to you by VideoUserManuals.com. I'm not going to waffle on about that anymore. Uh, as you know, it's an awesome plug-in to teach your clients how to use WordPress, and you can get it for $1 for your first month. Just check it out at uh, WPElevation.com slash V-U-N. Have a look at the video in action and have a look at the cheesy bit where me and my wife pretend to be, where my wife pretends to be a client and I pretend to sell her um, and hand over the website and show her how to use the plugin. It's very funny. Anyway, I think my dog's in that video as well. Um, that's the sponsor message. Oh, subscribe to the podcast at wpelevation.com slash subscribe. 
And when you do, you will get an email every Thursday from us saying, hey, there's a new episode ready to go. You can come and learn some stuff, enter some competitions, win some free shiz. And thank you, by the way, Seamus, for teaching me how to say shiz. Um, and what else? Oh, that's right. You, you do get, you actually get some free shiz when you subscribe to the podcast. I'm not even sure what it is, but you get like either a free webinar or a free report or something. You get a gift just for subscribing to the podcast. That's pretty cool. And that's at wpelevation.com slash subscribe. All the show notes for this episode, all the links that JD and I spoke about will be at, and of course the video will be at wpelevation.com slash JD Peterson. That is just all one word, all lowercase, J-D-P-E-T-E-R-S-O-N, wpelevation.com slash J-D Peterson. And that is also where you can leave your comment uh, in the comment section and tell us the number one thing holding you back from using scripted or something similar to get content written for your clients. And that's how you enter the competition. And the prize, of course, is 50% off your first order at scripted.com if you win the prize. I have no idea who next week's guest is because I don't believe it's in our calendar as yet. Although I can tell you who's coming up on the podcast. Justin, I think, let me just have a quick squeeze here. Do-do-do-do. Ah, Ryan Sullivan from WP Sightcare is coming up on the podcast. And I'll tell you who else is. Justin uh, Justin Ferriman from Learn Dash. Gee, I hope I've got your name right, Justin. Uh, in fact, let me just find out right now. Uh, I'm pretty sure it's Justin Ferriman uh, from Learn Dash. Have they got like an About Us on their website? That, uh, here we go, about, probably, oh, there he is, Justin Ferriman. I met him at Chicago WordCamp. He's also coming up on the podcast. I'm not sure who's on next week. It could be Justin from Learn Dash. It could be Ryan from WP Sidecare. It could be someone else. I'm not sure because my calendar, I think at the moment, runs out at JD Peterson. So I'm not sure who's scheduled next week, but it'll be someone awesome as usual. Uh, go and give us a five-star review at iTunes or Stitcher. really helps us come up in the search results and helps us spread the message to more WordPress consultants all over the world. I hope you're having a great time as a WordPress consultant. I hope you're learning stuff from the podcast and enjoying it as much as we are. And until next time, I'm Troy Dean. Go Elevate.